I'm here with our big host in, in Oakland, California. And right outside was the locations where a bunch of riots took place and the Occupier movement accelerated. Anyway, can you introduce yourself to those who are not familiar with you? Hi, uh, I'm R.K. Post. I'm artist for Magic the Gathering. I've been doing work for Magic for 13, 14 years. Uh, some of my better cards are uh, Morphling from Urza Saga, uh, Lightning Angel from Apocalypse, the, uh, the five avatars, Avatar Woe being one of them, um, and many and sundry things throughout the years. That's wrong. And, and uh, what got you interested into drawing art in the first place? Just art in general, or art, art for magic? Art in general. Art in general. Well, um, as a kid, I grew up on a farm, and um, it was kind of isolated. There really isn't much to do, and I just I like to draw. And what are your influences and inspirations? Um, influences? Well, I like to uh, kind of look at things around me. You know, uh, current artists, artists from like the turn of the century, old illustration. Um, also, you know, look at nature, go to museums, see all that kind of uh, fun stuff. You kind of integrate real-world things into make-believe things. Such as spider goat? Spider goats, sure. <laughs> and what kind of tools do you use to produce your works? I'm sorry? What kind of tools do you use to produce your works? Um, well, way back in the day I actually uh, used to you know, do a really tight pencil or something, scan it in, underpaint it, uh, digitally print it out on a watercolor paper, mount it to masonite, and paint in oils. So I used to paint in oils, but now it's um, Scan it in the finish in Photoshop. I just don't have a really a place to paint right now. So uh, eventually, hopefully, I'll, I'll fix that and I can get back to using oils again. So how tight is your space? My uh, right now, I have just like a little table in my bedroom with a, an iMac on it. So that's that's pretty tight. <laughs> so no secret studio space like your friend Jason Felix. Uh, no, no. After all, I did do. After all, I did go to a studio, his super studio, about a year ago. Oh, you did? Yeah. I've never been to his place. I've been to a secret studio, and before everybody starts thinking I must be going over to his place drinking beer, he actually lives in the same neighborhood I actually live in. Oh but, yeah, I was gonna say he's not far from here, so. Yeah, he's living out in the outer sunset. He, the other time I met him, and then. And since everybody's thinking, oh, you must be going over to his place, drinking all his beer, and getting all the super secret stuff, I'm like, nah. I, I know Jason. I don't see him just sitting around drinking beer, but yeah, but, I see him more of a wine kind of guy. But everyone's like, oh, he must be coming over there. Yeah, but that's or, just, or, or that's sitting, just, that's sitting just, in a studio with a Rob Roy. I, I see that as more as Jason Felix. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, out of all the games you have done work for, how how many have you played so far? How many have I played? That is a tricky question. I, I, I did play Magic way back in uh, the starter days. I played like a few rounds. Um, and I think I won, well I know, I know I won the last round with one of my own cards and it was just kind of like the, it's not going to get much better than this kind of thing. Um, and I know um, with games especially I really obsess and I don't get much else done. So um, I kind of steer clear of games as much as I possibly can. Unless it's something I know I can play for a bit, it's done, and then I don't have to do anything more with it. But Magic is not one of those games. Yeah, although I'm starting to tone down the amount of time I'm doing with Magic nowadays. Yeah. Uh, just, I know me, uh, it, it's it's everything or nothing, so. I obsess. And how are you approached for contract? What's that? How are you approached for contract? Uh, originally? Um, contract from, didn't work. From the beginning all the way to currently? Uh, well, in the beginning, um, I was an employee of TSR, Wizards of the Coast bought TSR. At that point, I contacted the art director and uh, asked me some magic cards. Um, I, I did have like a portfolio at Gen Con like a year or two beforehand. And I know it was horrible. So, so uh, once you get in, then they just kind of contact you and, you know, say, uh, how many pieces can you handle for this upcoming set? You let them know, and then they'll send you some art descriptions, a, a, a visual description as well. And from there, you submit a sketch. They approve it or make changes to it, and then you go from there to the final. And um, who was the art director for TSR before you went to? Uh, there were several. There was like one head, and it's it's nobody that anybody would know anymore. Um, 
there was one lead art director, his name was uh, Dan, and then there were a couple of uh, a couple of uh, smaller art directors in the room. So it was like old cluster of art directors. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, no, they were all. It, it was kind of a different time back then, too. Yeah, I'm like now this is like full blown internet and YouTube and all this other stuff. Oh, yeah, even submissions like totally different than it used to be as well. Because then you'd like submit a painting and you probably wouldn't see that sucker for like a year until, you know, say like the magic set was released or something like that. But now you can digitally, you know, submit your files. It's a lot faster and easier. And uh, can you tell us about your brief period of time working for TSR before you just took it over? Uh, that was an interesting time period. I was freelancing for TSR. Um, it was sort of in the in the in the downturn of the company. Um, a few of the staff artists have left, and um, so. They hired two of us, Todd Lockwood and I, right around the same time. And I think the big reason they hired me is because I could actually, I, they didn't have to move me. I was within driving range. So, um, Todd had a lot more experience than I did. So, it, for me, it was like learning on the job while I was there. Uh, it was in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Uh, I wasn't there too long before, not even a year before Wizards of the Coast came in and bought the company. Uh, at that point, most of the company moved out west to uh, Renton, and uh, the artists and a few other people, uh, you know, a few designers who are directors, stayed in the old TSR building for many months later. So it was just kind of empty and kind of bizarre, and and, it, and all the artists were like in one room, so you interact with these people on a daily basis, but you really wouldn't see all that many other people. Unless you got out and you wandered down the maze of the halls, down to the other side. Uh, what type of building was TSR in? Was it sharing the building? Uh, it was a. It was, was kind of like a bigger office building. Um, TSR, you know, in its prime, was a really big company. Um, at this point, they still either owned or occupied the space they were in. So there was no other tenants or lessees in the building. So when most people left to go out west, it was just it was really empty. They they, they had a warehouse on site and everything too. So. so what was the warehouse for? Oh, uh, distribution product. So they kept all the product right there. So when you know a game shop made an order of product or a distributor, you know a, a secondary distributor made a made an order. TSR had it all right there. Range. Yeah. Unlike the warehouse is in another location, the headquarters yeah. is in another location, this is in yeah. another location, and then it goes on and on and on. Yeah, you know, it was, it, was, it was one stop shopping. It was all right there. They made the games. Um, well, uh, they printed them off site, but then they brought everything pretty much back in the house and had a warehouse right there. So, so how empty was the building? As in, you could shout down the hall and you could hear your echo. Okay. <laughs> uh, after everybody moved? Yeah. <laughs> The Christmas party was really strange. <laughs> so what was the Christmas party like? Uh, it, well, there were not that many people left in the building, so it was it was kind of kind of sad, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, the, the dinners, were, uh, the artists went out to dinner. And, you know, the company paid for it after Wizards came in. That was kind of our little thing. But. Uh, what type of guy was Todd Lockwood at the time? Just um, today. Todd. At the time, um, I know you've been freelancing uh, a lot for fantasy, and um, you know he's, he's pretty well established. But he also came from a world of advertising. Are you guys doing So I know he was totally happy um, doing the work that TSR gave him. You know, you, you didn't have to do that advertising stuff anymore. So I mean, no, he's a great guy to work with, and um, you know, easy to talk to. And, he still is, but he, he kind of hides in his house now. So, but some people would do that. Yeah, no, I, no I issues with Todd at all. And can you tell us about your work with White Wolf? Uh, the work with White Wolf. Oh, I would expect some of the um, that, it's just like little bits and pieces here, sprinkled throughout the years. When I first started freelancing back in. Uh, 94, I did some like interior work for, um, God, I can 
age or something. It wasn't until like later on that I did, you know, like little vampire pieces here and there, some changeling stuff, some interior, some card work. Um, it was mostly through uh, one art director they had there, Pauline Benny. But she left the company after a while, and I really hadn't done too much after that. So. I wonder what happened there. Oh, she's still out there. I confirmed her time time. She's on Facebook. But she's up doing her own thing. What kind? What kind of person? What type of? I mean, what kind? What kind of guy was Glenn Angus when he was still around? Oh, Glenn. That's. I am. It's kind of a. I, I love really Glenn. A lot of events cause I don't um, really Glenn was just a great guy to hang around, and we'd done like a couple signings together. Great sense of humor, and you could just really easily talk to the guy. And, and uh, no, that was that was. I can be. I don't. I just don't enjoy have a big sadness. So. It's too much to uh, pay attention to. Thanks. <laughs> Although he's physically dead, his soul keeps marching on. Yeah, and I think his Facebook page is still alive too, which is kind of weird. Every once in a while, his page will pop up, and the it's like that's just kind of weird. But it's just like that family member who died, and at her Facebook page, she's popping up. Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> you know, I guess if nobody else knew your password, the, the page just kind of lives on. I guess so I don't know. Just like, just like everything. Just yeah. Like everything else that has survived. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's strange. It's really unfortunate what happened to Glenn. What happened to his kids? Um, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about his family in a long time. I know he had the one son who had autism, so I don't. Um, I don't know. It's interesting to know. Yeah. About him. Yeah. Oh, actually, I might have to investigate a little bit when I get back. Uh, are you currently at Big Fish Games? Why are you currently at Big Fish Games? Oh, why am I currently at Big Fish Games? Um, well, for a couple of reasons. I like the company. Uh, another reason is they do something that's entirely different from this. Maybe not entirely different. It's still sort of in the genre. You know, kind of that. It's more kind of like spooky horror kind of stuff. But I'm doing environments. I'm not doing like characters or anything. I mean, every once in a while I'll do something with a character in it, but it's not technically related to what I normally do, which is, you know, like making 3D environments and then finishing up in Photoshop. They're all kind of uh, layered so they can be animated in Flash. So it's it's different from this. And that's, uh, there. Was, at one point in time, I was doing work that was very similar to what I do in freelance. And you just easily get burned out doing the, you know, the same thing over and over again. I'm burned out. Yeah, but this and, and Big Fish is just a really good company to work for too. And uh, the scenery is really good. You're right there on the sands, look out the window, and see a beautiful sunset. So, but no, the people are just—they're wonderful. They're nice. Speaking of Big Fish games, when is Big Fish games going to restore that Pedal Bear game? I have no idea about that. Yeah, I we heard, had one. Yeah, I heard that your company had a game with Pedal Bear in it. I don't know what happened to it. It's. We release a game a day, so that is very possible. Plus, we also, uh, you know, Mac, PC, but we also do iOS, and Android, Facebook, so anything is possible. That was one that just totally escaped my radar. The one with Pedal Bear? Pedal Bear, yeah. But everyone likes Pedal Bear. Of course. <laughs> What does your spouse do for a living? Excuse me? What does your spouse do for a living? Uh, I'm not married. You're no longer married? Uh, no, I've had two two wives. <laughs> so, what did your first wife do for a living? Uh, she is currently a paraeducator um, in the Sumner School District in Washington State. Um, and the, the second um, wife owns her own company, Bullman Creative Group. They do sort of like uh, pairings with uh, companies and artists and things like that. So, so she's busy running her own thing. And what about your kids? My kids. Um, let me see. The oldest he works, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the middle one he's working right now. He was going to uh, DigiPen to uh, learn how to do concept art for video games. I think he wants to change his focus a little bit. And then the youngest one still in high school. Still in high school. 
think about that controversial game, Tentacle Bento, by Soda Pop Miniatures? I don't know the game. Do I know the game? Yeah, I don't know the game, no. Well... Tell uh, me about it. Well, Tentacle Bento is this tentacle monster game. You, you play the role of some tentacle monsters in a Japanese high school, and your objective is to capture as many high school girls as possible. Oh. Yeah, I got, yeah, I got yanked from the Kickstarter. Uh, if you market it just right, I'm sure it's just fine, but uh, I'm pretty liberal. I don't know. It, it's, it's a free market. So, so I think there's room for everything. On the, in, in, <laughs> you know, if, uh, if there's no market for it, it won't Chia sell, and it'll go away. So. Chia Lee, please come to the main event stage. Chia Lee, please <laughs> come to the main event stage. Thank you. So, uh, who won the Sakashima the Impostor event many, many years ago? Who won the what? Sakashima the Imposter event. I remember that you did a piece known as Sakashima the Imposter. Yeah. And then, and then it was given away as a prize. I wonder who won that event. I don't remember. I vaguely remember that at all. Oh my gosh. No, my memory is horrible. <laughs> I remember I sold the painting. And then, as you mentioned, yeah, no, I think it was tied with an event, wasn't it? And that, that card keeps coming back in EDH as well, so... I don't know. I, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I don't even remember who I sold it to, to be honest with you. Which is kind of weird, because I know like a lot of my paintings kind of where they wound up, generally. Private collectors? Gen yeah. Yeah. But then every once in a while there's a painting that just kind of slips through the cracks. It was like a busy day, a busy event or something like that, and someone bought it, and I just totally spaced on it. You know, someone will ask, do you still have this thing? And it's like, I'll have to look. Now, I understand that you travel a lot. How, I do. How much stuff have you lost to Homeland Security so far? Uh, nothing to Homeland Security. Nothing to Homeland Security? No, um, because I do travel a lot, I, I kind of know how to pack and what to pack. So, um, I, no, I, there, was, there was an event not too long ago where my luggage, kind of my the main bag I have with my prints, got lost in transit somewhere. And it, it took like a, an extra day for it to show up, but it showed up. So otherwise, I, I really haven't lost anything big and nothing to Homeland Security. So they didn't go in your bag, take your stuff and run off with it? <laughs> they didn't, no. And they didn't do what they did to that lady known as Esther I met at GDC she, who, who said that when she got her bag egg through the bag check, she knows that they cut her bag open. Um, a long time ago, in a different bag ago, something like that happened that, that there was something that was cut on the bag or something but I don't remember it was like when I was going to like San Diego Comic Con years ago or something like that I don't even remember what was in it I don't think anything was missing but the bag was pretty well trashed so. how trashed was it? I did, well I did pitch it afterwards so. but this one I've had probably for at least 10 years but I bought it with the intent that it would be pretty rough and it will take the abuse. It will survive. The, it will survive going through the mail if you ship it through the mail. Yeah, they've done that before, where they've had to, you know, ship it to uh, my home and stuff like that, where <laughs> it didn't quite make it back at a really tight connection. In fact, I thought it was going to happen last weekend too, but strangely enough, it made it through. In Chicago, no less. Chicago? What are you doing in Chicago? Uh, I went to Columbus for Origins. So last weekend I was in Origins and I flew back through Chicago. The flight was late taking off from uh, Columbus. And I had a connection in, uh, at O'Hare. As it turns out, it was, the gate was like 15 gates down. And there, there were three of us on the flight that I know for sure were on the, the connecting Seattle flight. So we all pretty much just booked it down. We all made it. And my bag made it too, which I thought was really strange. Someone was on top of it, so. Because you really want to lose lots of bags, right? I, I didn't think it would make it. I thought it'd be turning up later. I see. And speaking of other travel questions, what was it like to be a special? Players drummer? signed up for oh. the standard eight bear. Please come up to the main. I love the announcements. Anyway, okay. where were we? Anyway, what 
what was it like to be at uh, Spectrum Live last month with over 60 other yeah. music artists at the room, in the room at the same time? Yeah, 62. I heard that was the official count. Um, it was really amazing. I mean, uh, in terms of like street traffic, it was it was kind of a, a slower event because it was the first one ever. It was in Kansas City, um, and I know they did everything they possibly could to kind of advertise. But this is this this event will be more of a word of mouth kind of thing. It's like, oh, by the way, if you love this, you gotta go check this out. And I was you know trying to tell as many people as I possibly could as well. And a couple of people actually showed up that I I kind of recommended. Well, if you like this, you should go check this out. Um, but it will definitely be an event that will grow year by year as more people kind of know about it and the word gets out there. It, it's, it's, it's something that will build probably more by a grassroots kind of movement more than just straight advertising. Because straight advertising, I mean, it, Spectrum is a hard thing to describe. When you say it's just, you know, 100, 150, you know, some of the best artists in the country all in one place. People are just kind of confused by that, so. Everyone's always scratching their heads like, what? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I, I did okay, and some people did not okay, and some people did great, so. Again, I, um, I, uh, once they establish a date for next year, I'll, I'll definitely sign up for next year. Yeah, I thought about going, but since nobody was going to sponsor me, I wasn't able to do my marathon run because I was going to try to interview every single artist at that event. Oh, and some didn't have tables. Some were just wandering around. Like uh, D. Alexander Gregory, he was just walking around. Ben Thompson, just walking around. They didn't so, have tables. So there was about 70 artists. The, I think there were 62, including the ones that were just walking around. Uh, oh, and someone, uh, this is kind of crazy. Um, th this guy who, who likes collecting and dealing in uh, like alpha and beta sets brought in Drew Tucker just kind of after hours to buy some of his work or something so he was kind of hanging around at the there, there was one hotel that everybody kind of convened at and hung out and had drinks with later you know at the end of the night and so like Drew Tucker was just sitting there. it was just the most random thing ever I remember Drew Tucker's work yeah it's like he did the work of Plateau and then and then somewhere in between the fourth, the third and actually one of the printings for, actually between the unlimited and revised printing, they, his file got corrupted. So then his name was just like put right on the card of, of the revised plateau when it was not actually his work. Oh, yeah, yeah. When it was really when the revised version was done by Corey Lee's Yeah. But Drew, I don't know if he's included in the 62, so he might have been number 63. Because he wasn't really even official. He kind of showed up on Sunday and kind of walked around. But um, other than that, I mean, he was just kind of there on his own to conduct some business. So. Because I remember when I was doing this thorough scan for the first time, it was it originally added up to 55, and then when I and then when I included all of the updated list, updated names, it went over 60. Yeah, I mean there were a couple of people who weren't able to come. Like uh, Todd Lockwood wasn't able to show up. I think there was like a family problem or something, so he wasn't able to come. I remember that he was on the list. Yeah, so he he was one that was not able, and I think there were a couple others as well. I see. And uh, I understand that you designed the um, deck for the Invitational. What was it like to put that one together? I did what? The deck for the Invitational, which featured, which the artist had to build an entire deck based solely around all their work that they did for the game. Really? Yeah, I remember I remember that there was this weird... I'm kind of cool. No, I don't think it... You could build a deck out of my stuff, because I've done two lands, but I'm sure it'd be a horrible deck anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, I remember looking through the Invitational archives. It said, it's Arcade Post. Oh, this is a deck. It's only, it's only comprised of all of Arcade Post's work with the extension. Oh, well, I didn't design that. Someone else probably did. Because, seriously, deck construction? Not one of my strengths. <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody else took all your pieces? Probably, yeah. And they, you could now. And, and seriously, it, it, I don't think it would be all that good of a deck. So, Because <laughs> uh, you only have two lands. You have a uh, you know, black and a red, and that's pretty much it. I've done some decent blue and some okay green in the past. Of white, they'd all be excluded. So.
the Avatar cycle. What was it? What was it like to put that cycle together? Uh, that was kind of interesting because I was actually working on site of Wizards of the Coast. Um, they had a notion that they wanted to do these avatars, the five, one for each color. Um, so what I did was I, I did the uh, the concept work for them. So I designed sort of the look and feel of each one of them. Um, like originally Avatar Woe had wings, she was supposed to have flying. So it had these big black crow wings back behind her. Um, and by the time that I, you know, showed the sketches to uh, design and, and to be, you know, the senior art director, he was like, you know, these are just really kind why, why don't you just, we'll put them on your schedule and you just paint them. So, uh, what that was they, that. So, what did they get rid of the wings out of the Avatar Woe? Um, well, they, they changed a lot of things when they play test. So I think giving you know the Avatar World flying probably would have been just a little too much. So, so instead we made it to the air. Yeah, I think uh, through playtesting you have to add things, remove things, balance it a little bit. So that would then play that well. I thought I thought the Avatar World was things would be more interesting than what it is right now. Visually, yeah, I think so. But. After all, there's a bunch of demons walking around. It's like, if I have wings, why am I walking? Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just ornamental. Um, but sometimes when I do altars, I add wings to her. Just out of, you know, fun and whimsy. So. And um, can you tell us about your art books? Or what? Your art books. Uh, I have one art book that I printed, well I printed it, Cartouche printed about 10 years ago and it is horribly out of print now. Um, I don't personally have any copies, but you, I think you still got them on Amazon or half, um, ranging anywhere from 30 to 130 bucks or something. Wow. But yeah, I think the average price is like 100 It's crazy. <laughs> And it's only work up until like 10 years ago, so. So, how many print runs were there? How many were printed? How many print runs were there? Like, just how many, like, first edition, second edition? There's there? only one edition. I think they printed 3,000, and that was that. Uh, the distributorship for the books was, uh, I don't think it was great at the time. So, um, it was mostly through, like, comic book shops. I think Diamond might have distributed them or something. So, um... Bud Plant sold some, and then some wound up on Amazon. But I mean, 10 years ago, Amazon isn't what it is today either, so. But I hope to do another one eventually. I mean, I got 10 years plus of work since then, so. So, when are you going to expect that second book to come out? I've been, I've been trying to put that together probably for the past year and a half, but I always get busy you know, signing and work done, commuting, full-time job. Kids, family life. It always uh, puts things on the back burner. Gene, Gene Sebastian Rosebach told me that he was going to put together another book, and he said that he's expected to release it sometime in the near future, which comprises of the second decade of work. Um, I would like to do something like that. If I did it, I might actually. Uh, the technology's gone far enough along that I could just print it myself. Maybe do like a quick Kickstarter project to um, just get the base funding to print. I hope that the funding doesn't get yanked. Yeah, I, I think we'll be fine. I, I don't really do anything that's you know, overly racy or anything. So My stuff might be gross, but it's pretty safe. Unlike that typical Benzer game. Yeah, I was going to say, my stuff's pretty much all PG. There's no black bars on anything on, on Facebook, so... What's your policy on mail-in signings? Excuse me? What's your policy on mail-in signings? Um, I don't really have like a, you know, like a crazy strict signing. Just uh, if you send me things to the mail, uh, just include a way of just getting it all back to you. That's pretty much it. Uh, just make it as easy as possible. So like a self-addressed uh, stamped envelope, make sure it has enough postage. Uh, the post office I usually go to is really stupid about you know, if the cards get so thick and they stick through that, if they can't, then it's technically a package and then you have to pay like another buck and a half in postage or something. So, just, and I'm, I'm not insanely crazy. You know, I won't hold on to your cards because, oh my gosh, you don't have enough postage on it. But, I don't know, that's pretty much it. Just 
get to me safely and then provide the means so I can send it back to you safely. So, so it's like you'll find anything and everything you need to pet, right? I'm not that picky, no. So, if somebody sent you their, their dead dog that they stuffed, would you sign it? I probably would. <laughs> Just like Mark Zug. He said, I will sign anything and everything, including dead pets, but when it comes to scribbles and scratches, I need my brain cells. So, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, probably would. Yeah, that'd be like it's, that'd be a story and a half right there. <laughs> I've signed strange things over the years, so that wouldn't be the worst. Unless it's like, unless it's like, oh, uh, can you sign my dead grand? Oh, my grandpa just died. Can you sign my dead grandpa? <laughs> I probably would. Play later. So even dead people. <laughs> anyway, if you had to pick between the mafia or the IRS, as with your money, who would you choose? To do what? Who would you trust if you had to choose between the IRS and the mafia? If you were, if you were to choose one, of the, if you were to choose one of the other to trust with your money. I'd probably go with the mob here. <laughs> yeah. I'd probably stick with the safer investment. Why so? Uh, well, you know what their rules are. <laughs> so, in uh, the IRS, everything's all kind of wound up in red tape and bureaucracy that uh, there's a lot of places. Uh, the mafia, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So you got a whole sack of gold, it's like, oh, I'm sending it out to the Mafia. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd prefer that. If I, if I had to make a, an absolute choice, you know, going to my head kind of thing, so. And uh, how many weapon manufacturers, how many um, weapon manufacturers have approached you for contract so far? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. No, um, I, you know, I've talked to different people over the years about potentially making something. Designing something. Designing one. But, but yeah, but nothing, nothing's ever happened. So. No, and I actually collect guns, but no, nothing's happened. Actually, okay. you really collect guns? Old guns. Old like guns? yeah, old military rifles. What type, what type of military rifles? Um, usually like World War II and older. M1 brand. I don't have a Garand, but um, I do have a 1903 Springfield. So. Yeah, uh, 96 Crag, a bunch of uh, trap doors, and then, you know, percussion muskets and things going right back. Yeah. So, so if somebody were to try to break into your house, they, you, bust out your old, you bust out your old Springfield. They're all right there, down. yeah. And then you do the mad minute on them. Oh, <laughs> well. Not only that, I have a lot of uh, bayonets, so, so I can always go with edged weapons. So even if you do run out of bullets, you're still you're still gonna keep going. <laughs> Grab that uh, chase pot bayonet, you know, the great big long kind of sword thing. Slice and dice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what were you doing with uh, WizKids and Nintendo? Sorry. Uh, what were you doing with uh, WizKids and Nintendo? Uh, Whiz Kids, I, I worked mostly like on Mage Knight. I did some of the packaging. Packaging? Yeah. Um, way back when. It's been a few years. Uh, six, seven years, maybe. I did some of the, the Mage Knight packaging pieces. Um, and Nintendo, what was that? I think it was concept work for something that... It was either Wizards of the Coast or something was submitting to Nintendo for a game that never got made. There's been a, I, I worked for Microsoft for a year for a game that never got made. I worked for Sony for an MMO that never got made. So, well, it, it got made, just never released. So they never announced. They finished. They finished all the polishing and they're like, oh, I don't think it's gonna sell. Yeah. So they yanked the plug on it. There is so much stuff that I've done concept work for over the years that we'll never see the light of day. So yeah. unless the company goes defunct, right? <laughs> Uh, well, no, I mean, I'll show things. I just won't necessarily say what they were for. I'll try to cover my bases. You know, it's more like as a portfolio kind of piece. How do you sign your signature? Oh, um, well, it kind of looks like a, uh, like a, a calligraphy glyph or something. 
So, all right. For those who are wondering. So, uh, if I take my time, you can usually read a little better. So yeah, the P-O-S-T, my last name. And then I just put this box thing around it like so. And then the squiggly thing is my real signature, which if I just put that on a card, it would just look like total and utter um, crap. <laughs> There you go. Okay. So back when I was doing like black and white interior work, I used to stack my name in the year, you know, 95, 94, whatever it was, in this box, and it had like a postage stamp kind of edge on it. And yeah, I know, it's kind of cutesy. And, um, so when so I started what did doing, that look like? So, what's that? So what did that look like? Um, it was a little more rigid. Like a, to sign up for this amazing, fantastic, and enormously positive. This is a little quicker than I normally would, but these are really for black and white interior illustrations. So, if anybody's looking for some of your original work, they should look out for that signature. Yeah. So, um, things from riffs or uh, some old D and D stuff or some old White Wolf stuff. You'll definitely see that kind of silly stuff on it. And what does it look like when you're crunched for time? It was, oh, it was more like that. More like that. <laughs> so it looks a little more like that? Uh huh? So it looks a little it's, more It's kind like of degraded that. from this into sort of like this, which is kind of still interesting on its own. Interesting. is getting too reckless with his information he posts out on Facebook. I'm not aware. So I don't know what he's posting on Facebook. Let's see. One time I sent him an email request an email request to him. He honored the letter, but then afterwards he went to go mouth it off on Facebook. Oh. Um, I don't know. I'll say I have really no opinion. I mean, every artist is different. Um, probably the most outspoken one you will ever come across is um, Ed Beard. Ed Beard. So I suggest sometime you go find Ed Beard and talk to him. It'll be a trip. <laughs> yeah, I remember that he did Avalanche Riders. Yeah, so if you, if you um, I think he's located somewhere in the Midwest, but if you find him, talk to him. And, 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 and then you'll, you'll just know everything. Everything about his work? Uh, well, I mean... Um, You'll get my reference. You'll get why I said you should, you should talk to Ed Beard. <laughs> but as for, you know, I, I don't know. Um, every artist is different, every situation is different. I don't know all the details, so I don't know. I can't say I honestly have an opinion one way or the other. I, I just try to be as decent as I possibly can, and that's the only, really, the only thing I can really control is what I do. So. Uh, you try to keep in control, right? Try to. Or just be silly. So, um, when it comes to portfolio evaluations, art, port art portfolio evaluations, what are you often looking for? In, in terms of? When you're evaluating a art portfolio. What am I looking, oh, so someone gives me an art portfolio to look at? Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of draw from my personal experiences. Um, when I was putting my portfolio together, what you know was helpful. Um, usually, you know, you want to be concise, and you also want it to um, speak to who you're approaching. So, say if you're taking a portfolio to say like TSR, you want to do like D and D kind of stuff. Um, you don't necessarily need to include like life model drawings or you know, manga illustrations or anything, because they don't really apply to the kind of work you're trying to get. Does that make sense? So be concise, have a clear voice, and, and make sure, you know, 
you catch the attention of the person trying to get the attention of. Unless you're like Jason Chan, who could actually sneak manga art into his art and not have it to be spit out. You probably could, yeah, yeah. I mean, granted, there's every every exception to every rule out there, but uh, I'm just talking about like if you're just a starting illustrator and, and uh, yeah, yeah you're trying to get noticed. Because when I looked at Jason Wine Sculptor really closely, I noticed some manga features to it. And it was like, hey, he actually did it. He actually snuck some manga art in there, and it didn't get spit out. Yeah. Well, another thing, too, is um, don't... Uh, art vomit is not the way to go. You don't want to have, like, a portfolio that's, like, this thick, that it'll take, like, a day to flip through. You, um, you know, you should say it clearly, like, in, you know, 12 to 24, maybe 30 pieces at the most. Just a, a clear body of work. You can always edit, take things out, leave your strongest work in there. So practically about um, one magazine, one magazine of work. Yeah, probably. At the most, I mean that's thirty is like hitting the high end. Um, Twelve is probably right at the low end. Somewhere between there is fine usually. Yeah. And how often do you evaluate? <coughs> how good. often do you evaluate portfolios? Um. It's hit or miss. I mean, it's pretty random. Um, generally, like when I go to San Diego Comic Con and I'm seeing an artist alley, you, you see a lot more there. Um, one year at San Diego, actually, I did go off and do a portfolio review, so people brought me portfolios. Um, honestly, um, I'm not an art director, so I can't necessarily get people any work, but I can get, at least get them constructive criticism as someone who's kind of on the other side. So. That's the best I can do. Uh, I, I remember being the opinions editor last fall. I also had to double up as an art director. Uh, so practically, I had to write up the description. So I had to write the descriptions for the political cartoons. I then had to write up, up some other graphical stuff and all that other stuff. And then at one point, my illustrator comes back to me and says, how come this thing is so detailed? And then I'm like, this is so I don't have to shake my head no so many times. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can go two different ways as an art director too. You can be really wide open and just hope for the best, or you can be really descriptive and, and try to get exactly what you want. Yeah, I also kept a wide door. I also kept a wide open door policy, but then, but then each time I kept a wide open door policy, my chief was like, "I don't think it's going to work out." So it's practically so fact it was like a tug of war. So I had my illustrator. So I issued the last description. Consistent posts. I remember that I issued my last description to my illustrator, which was a conflict of interest piece. Oh. Where it's like myself and the chief editor are arguing over what should go into the newspaper while he's in a separate room illustrating what's going on, but then in a bubble in the bubble, it's like what type of influences each person has on each end and as they're arguing, as he's thinking about it. Yeah. I don't know. It's a difficult place to be in. That's why I just prefer just doing art rather than telling other people what to do. Yeah. yeah. It's more comfortable for me. I should probably um, get back to these lovely people here too soon. And um, how, many, how many times have you evaluated these portfolios at magic events? How many times did I? How many times have you evaluated these portfolios at Magic, magic events? Not all that often. It's more like if I do like a con, like an Emerald City or a San Diego Comic Con or um, things like that. Spectrum, that's a perfect place because people come to show. I, I saw a couple of portfolios while I was there. So back to me once in a blue moon. What's that? Once in a blue moon. At Magic events, yeah. And usually it's just someone has like a notebook or something they're drawing and and they want to show me. So that's. Oh, that's pretty much it. But Magic Vance, no, I, I don't really ever see portfolios. I mean, people are here are really to play. They're not. That's. They're singularly focused. But if, it, but if somebody wants a portfolio evaluation and they don't want to go through the hassle, oh, I need a portfolio evaluation, but no, you got to pay to get in. Oh, no. Um, uh, I do have some also uh, some cards with me as well for art submission guidelines to Wizards of the Coast. Um, generally, it's, it's more of a vocal thing. Someone will come up and say, you know, I do art. How do you start doing work for wizards? Well, 
I'll, I'll tell them what I can, and then I'll say, well, I also have this, and I'll give them the card. So if they want to uh, actually make a submission, they uh, know exactly what to do. At least through official channels, I guess. <laughs> What's the strongest piece of advice you could hand to a newcomer in the crisis field? The biggest piece of advice for... What's the strongest piece of advice you could hand to a newcomer when it comes to entering the field? Um, oh, that's a tough one. Uh, the, the life of an illustrator, um, with a few exceptions, is, is not an easy life. Um, it, it depends, you know, what your focus is and who you work for. Uh, you, you can take the route where I, that I did, where I, I work like a full-time job and I just kind of do freelance on the side. Yeah. At least my full-time job is, is art-related, and it's, it's art I like doing. So, um, in that sense, you know, I, I make a decent salary and I do all right. But as a freelancer, I, I know my... I, I'm not as fast as I would like to be because I, I kind of nitpick everything. So sometimes I get so narrowly focused, I'm, I'm looking at details and just kind of lose sight of the bigger picture. So, um, I don't know, it's, it's not an easy road, and I, I would honestly say also that the, the rates aren't being elevated as, say, the cost of living is elevated. So, it gets harder and harder and harder. There's always a glut of new artists coming Actually, to the market, too. I'm an artist, so I do so. have So, as long as the Federal Reserve keeps printing all that money, it's, gonna, it's not going to get any... It doesn't mean it's all going to come your way. <laughs> it's not going to... No. No, and, and freelancing for game companies, I'm sorry to say, you're probably not making any more than you were like 10, 15 years ago. It's just that the standard of living has gone up. It has, yeah. So it's it's no easier than it, it used to be. It's, it's a lot harder, I would think. But there's there's also different means of submitting work that are quicker, faster, easier. So, I mean, there's a little give and take there, but... It's, it's not an easy life, unless you find your niche, I mean, you're, expect you're going to struggle. I mean, not everybody does, but it's not easy. And you have to have thick skin, too. Because <laughs> you'll get that one piece of art where they just keep revising and keep revising it, and you just, you just roll with the changes. And then there's often... There's often no extra cost to it, right? Usually no. Uh, just do it with a smile, because um, you'll need to keep work constantly coming through the door. So. so as long as you're successful, you can keep rolling in money. Yeah, you, you kind of build a name and a reputation for yourself. You don't want to blow too many deadlines. If you do, then you kind of get that reputation. I can't say I'm the most perfect person when it comes to that, but I do what I can. Please find your seats. Anyway, thanks for your time. Okay, no problem. Thank you.